Happy Easter 2016. I hope you guys are having a great morning. I'm sorry it rained. I prayed, did what I could. The Lord didn't answer our prayers this morning, but you made it out, and that's awesome. Uh, I appreciate you guys coming out. Now, I've already been made fun of today, and I know, I know, some of you don't recognize me with a coat and tie on, and you're, uh, you're absolutely welcome to make fun of me, but I thought I'd dress up on Easter because it's a once-a-year event where we celebrate Jesus, so I don't feel bad at all, right? Some of you already told me I need to wear flip-flops next week to make up for it, and that's it's, it's weather, weather permitting, okay? We'll see how that goes. But I want to thank you for coming out on Easter, and I enjoy getting dressed up. I hope you do, too. Some of you have already taken your Easter photos. Maybe you joined us for our Easter egg hunt yesterday. I want to give a big shout-out to our volunteers. Man, they did such a tremendous job. We had around 250 kids show up to hunt. We had about 180 adults, and then close to 100 of our volunteers that just did all they could to make yesterday a smashing success. And it wasn't cheap. It was a big investment on our part into our community, and it went really, really well. Kids had a good time, and more importantly, there were a lot of families there that we invited back to Easter so they could hear about Jesus. So thank you, team. Uh, There's no way I could have done yesterday by myself. And here's the truth. I walked around yesterday with my GoPro and just got some footage because I didn't have any responsibilities because you guys did it so well. You handled it, and you guys are great. But this morning, we're here to do what Easter's all about. I love hiding eggs for kids. I love the excitement on their face. I love renting inflatables, man, having the park all filled with fun. I love getting dressed up. I love singing to Jesus, but I love most what Easter is all about, and that's why we sing, that's why we celebrate, that's why we threw a party yesterday, that's why we're having a party this morning, because of what today is all about. Good Friday was pretty serious stuff. Last week, we preached on Palm Sunday about the death of Jesus and how he did nothing to stop it. The God of heaven, the Son of God, man, he didn't come down off that cross even though he could. When they made fun of him, he did nothing. When they put a spear in him, he did nothing. When they nailed him to a cross, he did nothing. When they took his life, he did nothing. Why? So that in death, he could do something. You see, most of us, when we face our dying moment, when we get to the end of our life, if if someone were accusing us of what Jesus was accused of, if someone were trying to kill us for what they killed Jesus for, we would fight, we would do everything so we wouldn't die, but he did nothing. And then we would go to the grave, and when we were dead, we could do nothing. But here's the truth. Once Jesus was dead, when most of us can do nothing, he did something because only he could do something once he was dead. Only he could come back from the grave. And that's what we're celebrating this morning. We're celebrating what Jesus did. And it's as real today as it was back then. So I want to read you a passage from Luke. And I hope you'll turn there with me. Luke chapter 24. Luke's one of those people that gave his life to Jesus, following Jesus. And he was an educated individual, a physician, a doctor. The, the people that followed Christ, man, they were men, women, old, young, educated, uneducated, natural leaders, natural followers, all of them. Different people, but they followed Jesus. And Luke was one of them. And he wrote his account. I'm not reading you just the Bible. I'm reading you what Luke wrote, what Luke saw, what Luke witnessed, and what he held on to in his heart so that he could write it down and tell us about. So Luke chapter 24, I want you to read verse 1 with me. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared We see very clearly that men and women follow Jesus differently, don't they? Dudes are all about fighting, man. Peter said, Jesus, if anybody comes against you, I'm there. I'm with you. I'm going to follow you, dude. And then he dies, and Peter's like, what do we do? But the women, when the men didn't know what to do, the women did. They said, we're going to honor him in his death. We're going to go put some spices by his grave. See, that's the difference in men and women. We're all gung-ho, and let's go. Let's go have an Easter egg hunt. And then time for worship, guys are like, uh... I don't know if I want to sing. I'm not really emotional. It's just differences in men and women. And so the guys, they hang back, but the ladies, they go. And they get up early. And they, and they think about what's just happened. Sun's probably not up yet, but they get up early. And maybe they were hoping that morning when they got up, they would wake up and everything was just a dream, but this wasn't the first morning. They had gone to bed Friday night and woke up, and it wasn't a dream. Jesus was dead. They would have been Saturday night, and they woke up, and here we are. It wasn't a dream. This is real. 
the man we gave our lives to following him, the man who a week ago walked into Jerusalem and two and a half million people celebrated him as the king, the guy we thought was the new leader of the world, he's dead. And we got to figure out what to do with the rest of our lives because this is embarrassing and this is humiliating. All of my friends know that I followed that Jesus guy and now I look stupid. So it's hard for guys to deal with that. And these ladies, they get up and they, they head to the tomb. They walk together and I'm sure it's quiet. And maybe on their way they talk. Maybe they pray, I don't know. But we know what they were prepared to see. They were prepared to see the status quo of what happens three days after someone dies. There's usually a stench. Back then, they didn't seal them up like we seal them up now, so there would have been some, some odor. So they took some spices to help offset that odor. They were fully expecting to find a decomposing, dead Jesus Christ. Read the next verse, verse 2. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they went in. And they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed. They were completely caught off guard. They don't know what to expect. We have the great benefit of looking back at history and knowing what happened. I would like for you to imagine, though, that someone you just followed has died. You would not know what was going on. We all know the story because we grew up in Sunday school or we've heard it before, but they didn't. They were living it. And so they look around. They say, what happened? What's going on? But these men, these two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why are you looking for Jesus where dead people hang out? He's not dead. He's alive. Verse 6. He is not here, but is risen, exclamation point. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. How quickly we forget what Jesus has told us in the face of trouble. How quickly we forget that God has said, be still when we're in the storm. How quickly we forget that Jesus is with us when things go wrong. And they forgot what he had said. But isn't it so assuring, so reassuring, such a good moment when you remember, no, he said, he did, he will. And that's the moment in their life. I wish I could have been there because these ladies, man, they got to see something for the first time. They were the first ones. All of the millions of people since who've read this passage, all of the millions of people since who have given their hearts to Jesus, they were the first to realize death is not the end. We're following someone who has conquered the one thing in human history no one else has ever been able to conquer, death itself. And they got excited. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the 11, the dudes, and to all the rest. Notice verse 10. It was Mary Magdalene. Know these names. Joanna, Mary, the mother of James. These ladies, they got to experience something so cool, so awesome. First. And they go back and they tell the others. Verse 11, and their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. This morning, I want you to be reassured if you've come in with doubt. Here's the good news of the matter. There are people 2,000 years ago who doubted in the face of people telling them what they had just seen. There are people 2,000 years ago who, right after Jesus ascended, who, right after Jesus resurrected, they still didn't believe. So be of good cheer. Doubt has always been there, and doubt will always be there. But I have some good news this morning. You don't have to doubt. Peter doubted. Luke doubted. All these guys, they doubted. But Peter did something different. Notice verse 12. But Peter arose. Now, they doubted. They did doubt. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Let me remind you why Peter's so interested in this. The last time Peter saw Jesus, Jesus was being led away to crucifixion. And while he's being led away, Jesus looks and turns. And at that moment, Peter is denying Christ by a fire to people, saying, I don't know that, Jesus. I've told you once, twice, this is the third time. And if a lion curses, be called down upon me from God himself. I don't know him. And as soon as it comes out of his mouth a third time, Jesus turns, they make eye contact, and Peter is crushed. Peter runs out, cries and cries, and he hasn't seen Jesus since. Jesus died. The last time he saw his best friend, 
he was cursing and saying, I don't know him. I'm gonna tell you what, on your darkest day when someone avoids you and doesn't wanna be known to be known as your friend, boy, that does something. That's a dagger that goes deep. Peter regrets what he's done. So Peter wants to go see if what they're saying is true because there's nothing he'd rather do than take back what he said. So Peter runs to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves and he departed, notice this, marveling to himself at what had happened. First day, first Easter, Peter walks away, scratching his head and wondering. 2,000 years later, in 2016, people wake up today, they consider Easter, and they scratch their head and they say, what's this mean? What if it's true? What if it's not? What does this mean for me? This morning, I, I'm so glad you came to celebrate Easter. Regardless of your faith background, regardless of your understanding of what Easter is, I want to share with you three basic proofs that Easter actually happened. There are many who would try to prove to you that God exists, who would try to prove to you that Easter is what it is. I'm not here to prove to you. I'm just going to share with you three assurances that I have that Easter took place. And if you choose to believe them, great. But if not, I'm not going to argue with you. And I'm not going to try to prove God to you. And here's why. That's not up to me. You choose what you believe and I choose what I believe. Ultimately, you're going to place your faith in something. It may be reason. It may be an idea. It may be the Bible. It may be something else. I've chosen to place my faith in this. So I'm going to give you the three proofs that we Christians, we believe, prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this happened and what this ultimately means. The first proof is the empty tomb. Now, it's easy for me to say, the Bible proves it. I'm not going to do that. The Bible does tell us of an empty tomb, but the Bible's not the only historical book that tells us of an empty tomb. Jewish tradition tells us of an empty tomb, and if there's any group of people who didn't want there to be an empty tomb, it was the Hebrews. They wanted there to be a body in there because they're the ones that put him in there. And so they searched for a body. Rome also wanted there to be a body because they had performed the execution, and to that point, they had had a 100% success rate at, at execution, if you feel me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They didn't want anybody thinking you can get away from this crucifixion thing. It was very torturous. It was very awful. And they wanted everybody to know it always works. And so Pilate, he put extra guards. They did everything they could to keep a body in that grave. And once it was discovered that something had happened and that there was no body in that grave, these religious rulers, these obviously very, very well-funded and well, well aware of the situation leaders, they did everything they could to find a body. They didn't leave any... Stone unturned, you know what I'm saying? But they could not find one. Roman history, all kinds of historical books tell us something happened here and we could not find a body. And that's weird. And you could just say, well, that's just strange. It is. It really is. But I would choose to believe that his body was not there because he resurrected. But let's move on. Not only does an empty tomb prove that Jesus resurrected from the grave, there are thousands of personal accounts. Now, what we just read is we read Luke's personal account. You look over at Matthew, you could read his. I, but beyond the Bible, it's not that I don't believe the Bible. I trust God's word. But if you need proof outside of God's word, look in human history at the people who have written down that they saw or encountered Jesus. There are tons and tons of personal accounts. In the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul gives reference, and he says, I am telling you what I have seen, and there are many others also. And it's almost this dot, dot, dot. And remember, he wasn't writing to us. He was writing to people in Corinth. And what he was telling them was, if you don't believe me, I can find you other people to tell you. I wasn't alone. There are hundreds and hundreds of people that witnessed him being alive after the grave. Or at least witnessed somebody who looked just like him, talked just like him, did the same things he did. But I guess you could say that's just strange. But then the cherry on top, and there are more. This is not an exhaustive list. There are many reasons that I believe Easter happened, but these to me are the most poignant. The growth of the church. There has never been, nor will there ever be, anything like what happened in the days after Jesus resurrected. No other faith group, religion, or personal belief system has ever grown so rapidly overnight and overtaken the modern at that time world, aside from the church. Because within a matter of months, there were believers in Jesus who had never left Israel. He never left Israel physically, okay? 
They were believers in Asia. They were believers in Europe. They were believers in Northern Africa. They were believers all over the known world. And here's the truth of the matter. It didn't just happen then. The church still grows today. As we speak, in 2016, the Church of Jesus Christ is still the fastest growing faith group by conversion, asterisk, and here's why. You may understand and you know, and it's true. It won't be long until there are more followers of Islam in the world than there are Christians. But the faith group of Christianity grows by conversion. Do you know how the faith of Islam has grown and will continue to grow? By birth rate. Islam is centered in mainly Central Asia, the Middle East, and Northern Africa. Families in those parts of the world tend to have way more children than the rest of the world. They will be the largest organized religion on the planet. It's a matter of fact. But every year, the faith group that grows the fastest and by the most conversions is Christianity. And it's the only thing that rose and grew not by the sword, but by willing conversion. It wasn't a matter of days later that the church grew and they were conquering lands and taking over people. No, people were dying for what they said they believed in. It was the opposite. We grew by dying, not by killing others. There was no organized army of Jesus Christ that was going out and converting people at the sword. There are other faith groups and religions that have done that. That never tends to last because people don't tend to tell the truth with a sword to their throat. So, those tell me that something happened. But here's what really seals the deal for me. We talked about those personal accounts. Jesus had a lot of followers. He did. And a lot of them were flaky. 5,000 would show up when he was going to feed people. Then nobody showed up for his trial. You know what I mean? People were really excited when he was healing people and crowds would gather. But it was really about 120 that followed him faithfully and regularly. All the time. And those individuals, after the church started, you understand that after that it was very dangerous to be a Christian. Ten of the original 11, they died violent deaths because they would not recant that they had seen Jesus alive. Now here's where I want you to follow me because this is what does it for me. This is what matters to me. The Bible does it for me, yes. All these things matter. But I want to know who's willing to die for what they say they believe. You could tell me, well, Mark, those 120 people got together in that room, and they got a plan together. They said, you know what? We're going to form a religion. It'd be like if we all said, hey, you know what? We're going to make a, an oath and a pact, and we're all going to tell this same lie. We're going to say that when our leader died, he came back from the dead. Now, all of you hold on to this lie. Don't let anybody talk you out of it, okay? Here's the problem. If the Christians did that, if the followers of Jesus did that, when there was persecution and most of them started dying for that, if it was a lie, somebody would have given up. Somebody was said, whoa, no, no, it's all, it all made up. We, it's not worth it. I like my family. I like living. Can I have my job back, please? But they didn't. They didn't. By the thousands, they not only converted and followed Christ, they willingly gave their life for something they could not let go of. They said, no, I, but I saw him. <laughs> and I don't care if you take my life because I've realized there's more than this. And what he said is true and it's real. So let's, let's move quickly. So that's why I believe in Easter and what Jesus did. But here's the real kicker, and this isn't what you are wondering. What most of us, we don't need proof. What you want to know is this. What does it mean? What does Easter mean in 2016? Peter walked away saying, what, uh, what, what happens next? <laughs> Where do we go from here? What do we do? What, what does this look like? This is new ground. That's the question most of us have. What does Easter mean 2,000 years later? Because we're not in Rome. We're not in Jerusalem. We're not facing the Sanhedrin persecution like they were. So what does Easter matter in 2016? Here's why it matters. Because every one of us, every one of us, we need Easter, and this is why. I don't have to tell you this morning that the American dream comes up empty. I don't have to tell you this morning that no matter how much you make, no matter how much you pursue happiness, no matter how much you enjoy your freedom, no matter how much you have all that life has to offer, and as Americans, boy, we have just about everything life has to offer, don't we? It's so good, but here's the deal. There's always this emptiness that money, success, fame, friends, none of it can fill. 
Because you remember being young, right? Don't you remember when you were first getting out of high school or college and you got your first job and you thought, man, if I just get that first raise, man, I'll be set. If I get two or three raises down the road, I'm going to be making enough money where I'm going to be satisfied. And you weren't. Because this morning, if every one of us were asked if we would need a raise, we'd say, absolutely, I need a raise. I deserve a raise. Do you know what I've been going through? I need more. Because none of us are making what we're worth. It's crazy. It is crazy. We make more than we've ever made, some of us, and it's still not enough. And you remember getting your first house, right? Maybe your first apartment, and you loved your furniture. You loved how you had it decorated, but then you went over somebody else's house. <laughs> and you saw their kitchen, and you saw what they had, and you thought, man, I got to have that. So I need that raise plus that overtime, boss. And that's not enough. And you moved up and you got your 1,500 square foot house, the 2,000 square foot house. Most of us live in houses twice the size our parents grew up in. And what is it? It's not enough. We want more. And we got our kitchen redone. And then we go over somebody else's house, but they got stainless. And I didn't get stainless. I need to do it again. And it's just not enough. And you know I'm telling the truth. You got that new car and you thought you were the stuff. And then five years later, it wasn't what's up. And you got to get something nicer. I need to get into that luxury SUV class. I need to be driving something that represents who I am. And little by little, the American dream, man, the pursuit of happiness, it just keeps putting that carrot farther and farther in front of your face until you get to the end of your life and all you've done is consume and you haven't produced and you are not who you thought you would be and there is something coming up empty in this life. Tell me I'm not telling the truth because you know it's right. Because these things were never created to satisfy you. Don't get it twisted. I'm very thankful for the freedoms we enjoy as Americans. I am super gracious for the car that I drive and for the things God has blessed me with. But I don't misplace my values and think that those are what make me who I am and think that those are what life is all about. Those are awesome gifts and great benefits, and I use them to further the kingdom. But the truth of the matter is this. Life still comes up empty with all those blessings if we can't answer three simple questions. Why am I here where did I come from? And Lord knows what happens after this. And Jesus came to answer those questions that never leave our heart. He came down and he started saying crazy stuff like, you know, if you just pursue stuff, if you just pursue money, you're always going to be empty. And people were like, what? He said, I want you to live a life that is fulfilled in a different way. You know, if you live your life for you and it's all about you and it's all ever, always ever going to be about you, you're always going to be empty. And people said, kind of, go on. <laughs> he said, I want you to live a life that honors Jesus and loves others. And somewhere down on the bottom of the list, you are, whoa, 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 that's crazy. He says, I know, but that's how you were built. That's what you were created for. Some of you parents in the room, you remember your first Christmas giving gifts to your kids and how it felt so much better to give than to receive. Now, when we're nine, we do not believe that garbage, mom and dad. No, no, no. It's much better to receive. But somewhere along the way, we grow up and we say, it sure is nice to give the people I love something and watch them open it. So Jesus started talking this new life, and it didn't go over well with the religious crowd of the day. This morning, I want you to know I don't want you to be religious, I'm not interested in that jazz. I don't want you to get dressed up and come to church and sing out and go back and do whatever you want and care about you and be self-centered. No, I want you to do what Jesus said, and this is where it gets hard. I want you to love the people that hate you. I want you to love the people that hate you. And when he said that, we're always like, yeah, there's this lady at work. She's always running her mouth. He said that to people who would be killed by the people that hated them. Man, we think we know what persecution is. Let me tell you something. They love people who killed their family members. We know nothing of this type of love, but this is the love we were created for. And let me just, let me just close it up tight for you. This is what it really comes down to. The reason you're not satisfied, the reason this world will never do it for you, the reason everything this world has to offer will always come up short is because you were built, you were created with this little disconnect inside you. Your brain functions, your legs work, everything else works, but this little thing doesn't. You were created with this gnawing hunger, this deep longing to connect with God. It doesn't matter where you go in history, it doesn't matter what part of the world you travel to right now, you're going to find that most civilizations worship something or someone. 
Because God created us with this gnawing hunger for more than what we see, can touch, can hear, can sense. You're going to place your faith in something because we were built to have faith. We were built for a relationship with God. And so this morning, that's what we're celebrating. Jesus came to flip that switch, to make it all different, to say, you know what, you're right. It's hard to love others when they're awful, but when you have a relationship with me, it's possible. It's hard to treat people like we should. It's hard to do what's right, but through my Holy Spirit and through me living through you, you can and you will. And that's why the church grew, not because the church was super organized. It was fishers, doctors, and a couple of former religious people. They could not get along on anything. They were not organized, okay? It's not because they had tons of money. They were broke as a joke. It's not because they had great public speakers. They were just people who had witnessed something and seen something that was life-changing, not for their generation, not for the next generation, but for generation after generation after generation. And here we are. And let me tell you what it means in 2016. It means that you have the freedom to rise up out of guilt, out of shame, out of sin. Jesus came to change the way that we live. We don't have to lay our head down on our pillow wondering what happens after this. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt what happens to this soul when this body gets old and gray and dies. I'm going somewhere eternal and I'm going to see Jesus. He's going to greet me like he greeted them. And it's going to be great because I have faith in him. That's what he came to do. He came to remove our greatest fear, death. How many religious leaders had risen up to this point in human history and since? How many people had said they could fix every problem that people had, but no one could fix this one problem? We're all going to die. I know you're young. Man, I know you feel invincible. But here's the crazy part. My wife and I, we're celebrating our 10-year ten, ten anniversary in a couple of months, and I look back at our wedding photos. Boy, I have actually aged. I didn't think I would, but I have. You know, I cut my hair short on the sides because I got some grays coming in over there. It's true. I thought me and God had a deal worked out. <laughs> we're all going to have a moment where our life here ends. And Jesus came to remove the sting and the fear from that moment. And he did it by doing what only he could do. So this morning, the great news is, hey, Easter happened. It did. And it didn't happen so that Jesus could just have a little following and get his name written down in history books. He did it for you. He did it for you because he knew there was no other way for you to come up out of your shame, come up out of your guilt, come up out of your sin. He knew you needed a lifting hand out. That's why he did it. And if you're here this morning, you found your way into a church that meets into a sports hall of fame. Man, that is strange. That's a crazy story. But if you're here this morning, it's not by coincidence, it's not by accident. Jesus did that so you could hear the good news, receive the good news, and be raised to new life. Because let me tell you the truth. Without Jesus, you're already dead. You're living the same life that millions and billions of people before you have lived. A life where you consume, care about yourself, pass off into anonymity of history, and that's all she wrote. You were created for more than that. You were created for a relationship with God. And your time on earth is more than just a passing of time. It's a relationship with him that fills you with purpose so that you can love others and invest in the lives around you. You were never an accident. You were never a mistake. Jesus did this for you. And if you're here and you don't have a relationship with him, the best part of church is coming up. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to trust Jesus. This morning in our first service, we had two people trust Jesus in their seat. And I'm gonna tell you what, that's why we're here. I love speaking, Travis loves singing, but that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. So would you pray with me? And we'll close up this Easter service. Jesus.